So today I am beginning a, a four-week sermon series which will explore what uh, the Bible has to say concerning gender and sexuality. We will discuss uh, the Bible's authority on those issues. We'll discuss the gender of God. We'll look at why the Presbyterian Church ordains women. And we'll also look at the issue of sexual difference or homosexuality. And these sermons, they'll, they'll touch on very foundational Christian beliefs about who God is and also foundational beliefs about the Bible, how God reveals God's self to us today. And so as such, I do want to acknowledge that there'll be some things that you hear from the pulpit that you disagree with, and, and that's okay. And I also want to acknowledge that these issues are sensitive, and it's possible that uh, they'll trigger some sort of fear or, or anger or, or shame, and that's okay too. And I hope that the sermons are just the beginning of the conversations. I'm happy to be in dialogue with anyone in our congregation who has further questions about anything that is said. So with that, let's talk about sex. When we think about human sexuality, I think it's really important to begin with the Bible. Because the Bible, how we view it, often shapes the way that we view these issues. So some Christians believe that the Bible is, quote, the inspired and, quote, inerrant word of God. And this is what that means. That if the Bible is inspired, that God used human authors to write the Bible but that God essentially dictated the Bible to them. And then to be inerrant, that means that the Bible is without error, that it's God's, it's a perfect document which reveals God's perfect revelation to us. And so if one adheres to this inerrancy framework, it's likely that they'll read the Bible literally without questioning if what the Bible says is an enduring truth for all time, or if what the Bible says applies to a particular culture within a particular historical moment. And this is why most Protestant evangelicals, your, your Baptists, your Churches of Christ, your non-denominational churches, uh, do not ordain women. When 1 Corinthians says that women should be silent in churches, that women should submit to their husband's headship, Protestant evangelicals view these statements as God's enduring will, which cannot be compromised. So other Christians view the Bible as authoritative while still recognizing that the Bible has discrepancies in it. And it's important to note that these inconsistencies, they don't reflect poorly upon God, right? They're a result of human writers who are codifying a rich oral history and a result of human editors who made changes to original manuscripts when they were copying them, right? The Bible, even if we don't think it is an errant, is still the place where we locate God's enduring word. But for a lot of people, we believe we should read it critically. The interpreter has to make the decision about what in the text is universal and what in the text only applied to the writers and the people during biblical times. And as such, the Presbyterian Church USA ordains women because our collective interpretive body has decided that the writings in 1 Corinthians and in Timothy and elsewhere are products of that particular context and that they do not describe God's enduring will. And this view of the Bible is really challenging. It's a lot easier to just say it's perfect and we read it as is, right? Because this view of the Bible places the onus on the individual interpreter. The reader, with the help of God, has to discern what in the Bible continues to have authority over their lives. 
And so I imagine that most of us read the Bible with this sort of discerning eye. And so this morning, I'm going to offer six principles for how we might understand the Bible's authority for us today, specifically concerning the Bible's authority concerning gender and sexuality. And you'll find these six principles uh, on the last page of your bulletin right here at the bottom. The first principle today is that the Bible is a theological text which seeks to help us understand God. And so when we consider the Bible's authority, it's important uh, to understand the Bible's genre. And so I want to first start with what the Bible is not. The Bible is not a scientific textbook. And readers confuse the Bible's genre when we try to glean scientific information from the text. Right? The authors and editors of the Bible did not have access to the scientific method as we do today. They also did not have the same emphasis on rational thought. The original writers never would have expected that people uh, thousands and thousands of years later would read something like the creation story in Genesis 1 to 3 and make enduring scientific arguments about who is allowed to marry whom, or which gender is supposed to submit to the other gender in a relationship. And so if we find ourselves reading the Bible as a scientific text, we are misusing it and we should proceed with caution. Because the Bible is a theological text, written by particular cultures within a particular historical context as they sought to understand who God is. And though the Bible contains multiple subgenres, right? There's, there's myth, there's prophecy, there's history, there's epistles, there's short stories. The Bible's primary purpose across all of those genres is to teach people about the nature of God. The Bible equips us to better understand who God is, how God relates to humanity, and what God requires of God's people. And so as our scripture reading stated today, the Bible is a sacred text that's useful for teaching about God, right? not science, God, so that we may be proficient in spreading God's word to our communities. Once we uh, have the Bible's genre down, I think it's also important to note for principle two that the Bible's not this pristine document that's been fixed throughout the ages. It's God's living and enduring word. Right? The Bible is what we call a historically affected document. And that's a fancy way of saying that the way we interpret the Bible is linked to our social context. It is impossible to interpret the Bible in a vacuum. It's impossible to not be influenced by the, all the prevailing ideologies we are surrounded by in our world. And I'd like to illustrate this by tracing Christianity's evolving conception of marriage and sexual intercourse. And so, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul suggests it's better for a Jesus follower, follower to remain celibate, meaning never to have sex. And Paul only grants one exception. He says, you know what, if you... If your sexual desires and urges, if you do not have enough self-control to not give in to them, only then should you get married and then have sex. But other than that, you are to remain. The ideal Christian form is celibate singleness. And Paul's theology is a product of the social context in which he lives. Paul would have been trained in Platonic thought. Plato argues that what is true can't be physical, right? Plato separates the mind and the body. And Plato believes that the mind is superior to the body and that people who give in to their physical, fleshly, carnal desires, Plato calls them uh, weak, indulgent, and dishonorable. And so when Paul suggests that celibacy is the ideal for Jesus followers, He's heavily influenced by Plato's 
philosophy. But that doesn't stay that way. Because then three centuries later, Augustine, who's a bishop in the early church, shifts Paul's teaching. Unlike Paul, Augustine views the body as neutral. He believes the body can become an instrument of sin when we place our human needs above God. But he goes on to argue that procreative sex, right, sex with the purpose of trying to have children, is part of God's natural order. But we can't get too excited about this because Paul also said, or not Paul, Augustine also says that any sex outside of procreative sex is sinful. And so now if we fast forward to the 21st century, right? And if you go into most even fundamentalist churches, which I, I know a thing or two about because I was raised in one and I went to them for 25 years. So when you go into churches that hold the Bible as an errant and they talk about sex, you'll, you'll hear sex is good. Sex is a gift from God. And that married couples should have good, pleasurable sex even if it doesn't result in babies. So we have this evolution where we go from the body's bad and you should be celibate to the body is neutral and you can have sex, but only if you're trying to have kids, to now you can have good, pleasurable sex. And this is because biblical interpretation is a product of social context. There is not and there's never been this sort of one right interpretation of biblical sexuality. Community beliefs around gender and sexuality evolve and will continue to evolve in the years to come. And this evolution doesn't mean we, we look at the Bible and take it less seriously. It means we remain open to God's continuing revelation in our lives today. Right? Biblical inspiration is not a one-time event and it's over. Right? God created, and God still creates anew. And we, as we encounter the Holy Scriptures, are continuing to learn about the nature of God in new and innovative ways. God's revelation is not shut to us. We can continue to hear God and evolve with God's purposes. And this brings us to our, our third principle, which is that, because the Bible is not this pristine document, the Bible always requires interpretation. Right? People, I imagine you've felt this before, people are always searching for that real Bible. The Bible which isn't clouded by interpretation. And this is one reason why biblical scholars uh, have their, their Hebrew and Greek Bibles, right? They want to find that, that true historical meaning, but they still haven't found it. And this is another reason why maybe you go to a Bible study or a book club. You want to find that one true meaning of the Bible. But the meaning of the Bible cannot be separated from interpretation. Even the Bible being translated into English is interpretation. That's why different groups read different Bibles. That's why in the Presbyterian Church, we read the New Revised Standard Version Whereas if you go to a, a Church of Christ or a Baptist church, you're probably going to read the New International Version or the King James Version. Different groups read different Bibles. And then all groups read the Bible selectively. They pick the verses that they want to support their theological position. The Bible is a very malleable text. It's been used to support slavery, and it's been used to support abolition. It's been used to support women's suffrage, and it's been used to deny women equal rights. You're always going to be able to find a verse in the Bible which supports your position. And because of this, we go on to principle four, which is that the Bible doesn't always provide us with clear answers. It invites us to ask deep questions. If our reading of the Bible results in certainty instead of, of mystery, we're probably reading the Bible wrong. Uh, biblical scholar Pete Enns, who's he's one of my favorites, you can, he has a podcast called The Bible for, for Normal People, he says this, 
Many Christians have been taught that the Bible is this truth downloaded from heaven, God's rule book, a heavenly instruction manual. You follow directions and out pops a true believer. But if you deviate from the script, God will come crashing down on you in full force. And he goes on to say, when you actually read the Bible, then you see that this rule book view of the Bible is like a knockoff Chanel handbag, right? It's fine as long as it's kept at a distance away from a curious and probing eye. When reading the Bible, a curious and probing eye is going to find inconsistencies and contradictions. It will find stories of people who make questionable moral decisions. A probing eye will find that they emerge from the biblical text with more questions than answers. And and that's the point. Because if our reading of the Bible provides us with all the right answers, then we're, we're reading it wrong. The Bible forces us to wrestle with impossible existential questions. Right? It's in that wrestling, just like as Jacob wrestled with, with God in Genesis, it's in that wrestling which we discover more about the nature of God. And since the Bible doesn't always provide clear answers, we go to point five, which is that the Bible does. And what I mean by that is biblical interpretation is a performance which we live out in our daily lives. Our actions reveal the Bible to the world. So, for example, one might read Jesus' command to care for the least of these in Matthew 25 and say, you know, I'm going to become a host for compassionate hands. Or one might read in the Gospels that Jesus' command to to welcome the little children and decide they're going to become a, a child Sunday school teacher. In both of these examples, people are performing the Bible and their performance has an impact on other people. And this impact on others, these ethical consequences that come from the reading of the Bible are really important to consider when talking about human sexuality. The study of the Bible concerning gender and sexuality is not just an academic subject that we we study at Vanderbilt. Why? It's a real thing that impacts real people in their real lived experiences. And here's how. Some have listened to sermons discussing Paul's writings and they feel like they are unlovable, unworthy, that they're damaged goods because they lost their virginity before they were married. Some have studied Romans 1 and in response enroll their child into gay conversion therapy where the child is submitted to electric shocks which try to change their so-called unnatural thought process and rid them of homosexual desire. Some have read 1 Corinthians and decided that being sexually assaulted by a church leader or even by their own partner is an act of Christian submission which should go unreported. And some have read Leviticus and decided that homosexuality is such an abomination that they have to kick their child out of their house and leave them homeless. And these are frequent occurrences, right? 40% of the U.S. youth homeless population are members of the LGBTQ community. And these interpretations of the Bible, they're not just the result of a text's authority. They're the result of human interpretation. When our interpretations further death and shame, we don't get to to hide behind the Bible and just say, oh, the Bible says so, blame God. Our interpretations have ethical consequences. So Will, as 2 Timothy remarks, Our interpretations allow all people to be equipped for good works? Or will our interpretations perpetuate shame at the expense of one's humanity? Will we position ourselves as the judge, as Christ? And and that brings us to our sixth principle, which I think is the most important. 
which is that a Christian reading of the Bible should center the saving work of Christ. Humans are flawed, and our finite reason will never allow us to interpret the scriptures in a way which fully grasp it, grasps God. In our own limitations, they demand that we interpret the Bible with humility, remembering that Christ remains the foundation of our faith. And Christ's message, right, this wonderful message of the Christmas season is that Christ brings good news of great joy to all people. And so when our interpretation of the Bible shames people, the Bible loses its power to bring good news. It becomes a weapon which we wield in our quest to be right. However, when Christ is at the center, not us, but Christ, the Bible effectively communicates that God entered into our world in the form of Jesus to save us from our sins and to defeat death and all evil forces once and for all. Right? The good news of the gospel is that you don't have to be perfect. That you do not have to understand everything. That pure and perfect biblical interpretation that our reason does not save us. The Bible is a text which states that Christ liberates us from our lack of reason. That Christ indeed frees us from everything that holds us back from God. The Bible is just one of these tools that God uses to equip and empower us to be agents of hope and grace and unconditional love. And so my prayer for us in our readings of the Bible is that our interpretations would grant Christ's freedom to all people, to everyone in our community. Amen.